privilege of introducing our keynote speaker. And I think what the, this, what's nice is this really connects well with Next Generation Science Standards because um, what we want, what's represented in Next Generation Science Standards is trying to connect kids with real world uh, examples. And so we're bringing that to you here so that you can uh, share uh, what you hear. Um, from Dr. Anderson's presentation. And actually, I'm going to have Kathy just speak really quickly because she's helping connect her kids with the real world by uh, uh, <laughs> connecting with Dr. Anderson. Well, so by connecting with Dr. Anderson. I just want to compliment him. He is an environmental stud uh, studies professor. You'll forgive me if I It's all good. It's all good. But he has his students working on environmental issues, doing research by building their own robots and they're working out on the islands on all sorts of different kinds of issues. But it's really spectacular for me to watch what's gone on with that because his work and with his students, it's trickled down to middle school because his students bring their um, expertise in building robots and they are mentoring our robotics teams at little middle schools like mine where we have 200 kids. But I get university mentors at my school working with my middle school students and they not only learn about robotics and get to do those kind of competitions but they're also seeing how we're applying robotics in today's world for scientific research. So I just want to compliment him and thank him because oh, thank our you. robotics team plays six out of 39, it was our for 38, something like that, first year and they're all so excited. So it's just wonderful to see that trickle down and thank you sir. Thank you guys. And, and I want to say thank you for the invitation. It's awesome to see so many people that I know here that I've worked with or have taught my son or, or, or we do projects together. So this is like coming home. So thank you for the invite. This is, this is a great privilege for me. Before we get going, just as a bit of clarity, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an electronics person. I'm a, I'm a field scientist and these are tools that we use. And as we'll talk about, the technology is getting so simple, you do not need to be a PhD electrical engineering person. That, that can help, but you don't need to have those kind of skills necessarily to make this stuff work and make it work for your, your students. So it's late in the day and probably people need a libation or, or something. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to talk. If I ramble or I say something that doesn't make sense, please stop me. If you want to talk about something else, I'm more than happy to, uh, to, to take on a different subject. So I'm going to talk to you today about what I, we're supposed to have names for these things. We haven't quite figured out the name. So conservation mechatronics sounds kind of sexy. The kind of thing, <laughs> kind of thing you put in a grant proposal that sounds like you're important or something. So we're currently playing with that term. But basically what we're talking about is this new technology and interdisciplinary approaches to thinking about problems in that technology and how that one can help us answer some, some science questions, some applied problems, but also how it really can spark student interest. It can spark any student interest, but we also find it particularly works well in some students that have not been engaged with um, science and maybe some of the more traditional uh, routes of, of coming around to it. So, so my name is up here, but this is really a huge amount of folks, of, of some people in the room, all around. So I, d I don't mean to take credit for this. So in case you do pass out and fall asleep, just in case, this is what the this is my conclusion slide. So, so the first is that... <laughs> So the, I, I know my audience, right? So, so, so the first is, um, I think you re we really have to understand the proper context. So I'll talk about that for a little bit. And this really helps when you're talking to administrators or others that might have a little bit of trepidation about this technology. So it's, I think it's important to talk about we're really at this unique place. It, academics always tell you that, this is special. But this one actually does seem to be a, a lot of uh, game-changing things have come together just in the last few years. So we'll talk about the context for a bit. Then we'll talk about what we, the last few years at, at Cal State Channel Islands and our history um, so, you, so you can get a sense of how we got here. And I think a lot of these, if not the whole thing, at least many of the parts you guys can replicate relatively easily in, in your different institutions and schools and stuff. So, so we'll talk about what happened to us. And again, you guys can, can inter, interrupt me. But the key part of that is we had have a little bit of equipment and the right philosophy. And those two things together start and then they feed off of each other, and then they start to bring more, more philosophy and more uh, equipment and all that kind of jazz. So you don't need to have like a million dollar startup grant to get going in this, in this uh, burgeoning field. And then we'll, we'll have some time, depending on how tired you guys are, I'll go through some examples of how we're actually using um, this technology. So let's get going. So the key thing is this. This is my iPhone. It looks maybe not quite like an iPhone because I go to weird parts of the world and 
do things where stuff blows up and underwater and stuff. So, so this, is a, this is a protective case, but all this is is a, is a smartphone that almost all of you guys have in your uh, pockets or purses or whatever right now. And, this, and, it, and I know that we sometimes look at this and go, oh my God, it's a distraction for our students and they're na 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 But truly, um, we can forget how magical this device is. And this device in particular is one of the reasons why we have the types of robotics that we do at my school and why we have the, the cost and all that kind of stuff coming together for um, all of us right now. One small example is this. So this is uh, how, how much uh, 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 iterations on a computer circuit um, can happen per unit dollar. And this has been crashing since this graph starts a little bit after I was born, but basically it's been going down and this sucker is um, having about every year. So these things are getting more and more affordable uh, by the minute. And so not only are they getting cheaper and cheaper, the speeds are, are getting faster and faster. They can do more and more things. So you've heard that before with computers, and people have talked about this for a long time with computers, but I'm specifically talking about cell phones. So the things that cell phones brought to us over the last decade are, and I'm, in particular I'm talking about smartphones, are all the things that oftentimes we hate, all the kids playing the games and all that stuff. To play those games, there's sensors that when I turn left, it knows we're turning left. If I shake it, it knows how fast it's moving. All those sensors used to be incredibly expensive. Now, they're super small and they're highly accurate, right? They have to be accurate. Otherwise, when you tilt it to do your pinball game or your destroy the alien, whatever the heck it is, um, it wouldn't work right, right? So there's all these, these incredible forces have come together to make these things very cheap, very small, and then really, really key for us, incredibly low power sipping devices. They use hardly any electricity so they can work off of the battery on your cell phone. While that's great for cell phone manufacturers, for us it has a knock-on effect of all these manufacturers have figured out how to make these, these, cheap, sent, these cheap components um, that are highly accurate and that need very little uh, juice to make them run. That's the first part. Uh, the next part is um, uh, some, a bunch of things that have come together. One is um, and I'm really bummed that I, I was, well, I'm not bummed I was with my family today. I shouldn't say that. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm disappointed I wasn't able to hear your wonderful morning speaker talk about Arduinos and stuff, exactly what, what we're talking about here. And so this is another example of that. It's, it's just, it's manifesting itself over and over again in a lot of different ways. First and foremost, we don't have to have a million, so at Stan I, I left Stanford University to come uh, help start this university. And there we had all kinds of these fancy engineering shops and super expensive things and it was great. And if I wanted a big part, I could go down the hall and pay some guys some money firstly. And then uh, he'd take my order and then it would take three weeks and then I would get my thing. And then it probably wasn't quite right. So I'd have to go back to him and can you tweak this? You don't have to do that anymore. Um, if you have that capacity, that's great. But now we have these 3D printers that truly are changing the world. So the example I always tell um, is uh, uh, last year my chair was on sabbatical, which was horrible because that meant I had to be chair. And, um, and I was busier than normal and I went into my lab and I have many, many students doing lots and lots of research projects. And one of my students was working on one thing I'll show you in a sec. And he said, how about this? And it was the thing to attach a GoPro to one of our submarines. And I looked at it. It was a 3D printed part, piece of plastic. And I said, oh yeah, you know, that's great, but it's too th the walls are too thin. So no, because we're really poor, right? We can't afford to lose a GoPro. We don't have the money to replace another, you know, several hundred dollars. And so he kind of went, oh geez, okay. And he turned around and he walked out. And then as I was trying to leave, uh, uh, all my, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Anderson, all my other students, can you identify this worm? And there's this bat dead thing and get it. So all of a sudden, 45 minutes later, I'm, I'm trying to leave the lab. And my family's calling and dinner's cold and where are you? And we're supposed to be the priority and all that good stuff that happens, right? <laughs> and so, and so as, I, as I walk out of the lab, my student comes walking back in and he goes, so look at this. And it shows me this, this attachment part, you know, 45 minutes later. And I said, uh, no, dude, I told you it's too thin. I want the walls a couple millimeters thick. He's like, you know, I did that. He'd gone back to the computer, changed the, changed the shape in the program, push print and the thing had printed out in, which was maybe total cost of who knows, two cents or something like that, a penny and a half, something like that. He printed a new part and it was, it was it, he was right. I looked at him and like, oh my God, this is what we want. So it's that kind of capacity. You don't have to rely on somebody down the hall or some incredibly expensive who, you know, whoever. 
Uh, so one, we have the 3D printers. Then the other thing is you can print in virtually whatever. So my lab right now, again, we're not an engineering lab. We mostly print in plastic because we do stuff in and around water and jazz. But, but uh, you can print in plastic. You can print in metal. You can print in wood. You can print in chocolate. You can print in pretty much whatever you want. And new materials are coming out, uh, coming out all the time. So that's a huge game changer. Next thing that we use a lot of is this open source, we tap into this open source movement. Typically, you guys might hear that from open source computer code, right? The free program and everybody works on it, what have you. So that's absolutely important. But then also, a lot of our hardware is made specifically to work with this um, computer code. So that's really key. And then as you guys, uh, and, and then to do that, to be engaged with this, um, you guys have been hearing about maker movements and maker spaces and all this and that. that, that that's what all this is related to. It also is a community, right? That's the important part. It's not just that somebody has some free stuff put up. If you're stuck, if you don't know anything about what an LED is or how this thing turns this way, you just ask people. And, and people are really down with, well, let me show you. You know, a little quick answer. Do you get that? No, you need some more time. Let's talk about it more in depth. And that's super, super key. All that stuff has come together uh, for us. So first we're in a, a magical time. We're also in a magical place. So this is my uh, campus. And um, we are in a, a former uh, state mental hospital. So I fit in perfectly well. Uh, so we have this brand new campus, uh, but it, it, it's, you know, 70 year old buildings, 70 year old trees. And, and because we're a brand new campus, we've been able to do some things that, um, not because we're necessarily smart or anything, but we're just starting up. So we want to do new things. So one of the things that our campus fosters, which has really helped us do this stuff, I'll tell you about in a second, um, is the fact that uh, they really tolerate new things. They tolerate me, which tells you a huge amount about them. But, but they really tolerate and encourage not just new thinking, but new programs, new ways of, of designing things. Um, designing uh, learning communities, designing curricula, designing whatever, and, and their, their games. So that really helps. The next part is the very fact that we're new and we just need some new buildings. And so if you need new buildings, we're sort of blessed to be in this spot where we can say, well, it should be like about a robot thing. And they go, okay. And so, so that really helps. And then uh, thirdly, which I, is a massive strength, we have a very diverse student body and diverse in just about every metric you can pick, the, the traditional metrics of you know, racial and class and all this and that, but also a lot of groups that we typically don't, that at least, so I was an undergrad at UC Santa Barbara. I did my graduate school at UCLA and then I was up at, at Stanford for a while. Um, great people all over at all those places, but um, I didn't come close to seeing the diversity that I see at my current school. And that includes everything from GI Bill folks, you know, retired folks. So we have this, this huge cadre of, of people from different aspects of life and all and almost all of them, everybody that's come to my lab, we haven't tried exactly every single group or whatever, but, but everybody that's come in contributes. Um, you do not need to be a science major to be in my lab, although most people are. We have business uh, marketing people. We have all these different folks. So that diversity is a huge strength. And when I talk about this to the traditional folks that, that work on this stuff, which are generally engineering programs, Great folks, but they're really, they really care about building. And when I talk about the benefits and I say diversity, uh, sometimes they, you know, no, not trying to be mean or ill-intentioned, they kind of say, what do you mean? Why is that a strength? And I say, well, because it, we're diverse. And they say, well, yeah, but why is that a strength? They're coming at it from the perspective of, I want to make this wing fly 10% better, right? So if that's your goal, you maybe want somebody that just really knows about wings and you want more wing people, right? We don't care about the wings. This is, these are just tools to get us to a place. And if you, just, if, you, if you care about more of the final output, the final goal, you like having perspectives because, oh my gosh, this guy used to fly airplanes or, oh my gosh, this lady used to work on endangered birds and they know that if we do X, that might be a problem. So that's a strength for us. And that, that's what I think our campus has. And I think a lot of your campuses have uh, great diversity as well. And then there's my program. And my program in particular, which echoes a lot of the overall program uh, aspects of our campus, but we, we place an extremely high priority on it, which is interdisciplinarity. So 72% uh, of the classes that students take to graduate under my major are taken outside of my program. They have to take econ, they have to take poli sci, they have to take biology, chemistry. And so, that's a str so that helps us. We're very applied. 
So we don't typically do basic biology or basic research. We do uh, stuff that's trying to answer a management question, and that's really helpful for engaging students that maybe have been underrepresented in science and, and don't maybe see people that look like them doing some of these things, and, and that, that seems strange. When we bring in the applied aspect in, they tend to get much more engaged and see the value. We're field oriented, so that also helps. So um, it doesn't help for me to say to my new students that maybe aren't interested in science and this and that, that hey, let's go to the Cook Islands or let's go to Costa Rica or the Middle East where we work. They, that freaks them out. But if we say, hey, let's go to the beach in Oxnard, <laughs> they go, okay, that, that's cool. I'm, I'm not, that, that, I don't, that doesn't seem too far out of the bell curve for me, right? Let's go try that. So the field oriented aspect really helps as well. And then we have a strong focus on service learning. So going out into the community and helping solve community problems and all of that helps, um, helps us get where we're going. All that, all that together has produced what, uh, so my lab is called the Pirate Lab. I would tell you the full name, but I'll get in trouble. Because there's a, there's a policy that was changed. It used to be called Pacific Institute of Restoration Ecology. And so that we just made that acronym Pirate. And then, we, then the campus passed a few years ago a policy on institute and centers. And they said, you're not an institute. You can't use that name. So now we just call ourselves the Pirate Lab. And then everybody says, why are you called Pirate Lab? Like, are you rebels or something? Um, and so, uh, so we call our robotic group Pirate R. So, so this is the aerial and aquatic robotic research team. So it's, it's, it's my lab, it started as my lab, but it really involves people from across campus, computer science, biology, all this and that. So there's students and faculty all around. These are my students presenting at um, the DARPA challenge uh, last summer. We have, we have some unique things at, at Channel Islands that maybe you guys don't have at your campuses, but that doesn't mean you can't uh, help make them work. But one thing is in the background here, this is one of our old hay barns from the time uh, it, was a, it was a food producing hospital. And so most people look at this and say, this sucks, this is a liability. We look at it and say, this is an indoor space. We, we, some of us were talking about earlier about flying indoors. This is technically an indoor space even though there's no walls on it, right? It's technically an indoor space, so the FAA can't say boo about you in there. <laughs> so we have, a lot of, we have a lot of places like that. And then I'll talk about in a second some of the policies that we have and all this stuff comes together to really help us. The key thing also with all this is we're an educational institution. We do tons of research, but we're teacher scholars. We're not scholars. And this education focus has been markedly different from, from uh, at least most of the other folks around the country that are trying to do this, they, they're coming at it from a pure research focus. We're coming at it from a trained students focus, and then we'll also get some good research, but, but that's our, that's our um, focus. Again, applied and interdisciplinary, like I said. So let's talk about how, how it happened, how we got all these robots and things at, at Mike. Am I going too fast? Is this, is this okay, you guys have questions? Okay, so, um, so let's talk about what happened at campus. So, um, there's two parts that I think you guys would, would need to get if, you, if you're thinking about doing some elements of this. One is just the actual physical equipment, the parts and the, the units themselves. Um, but you also need some supportive educational philosophy and in some cases some policies. And they, they're really, um, they really feed back on each other. So it's not like you necessarily have to start in one place or another, but they both help out. Although the key step seems to be, for most folks, getting their very first piece of equipment. There's so there are institutional hurdles and this and that, uh, but, but nevertheless, these things do feed back upon one another. This is what started it all. This is a unit that, um, this isn't quite life-size, almost life-size here on the screen. It's a little teeny bit smaller than the screen image. This is what started us down this road. So this was five years ago. Um, we were approached by some folks that wanted to donate this. This is a, a Old. This is about already almost 10 years old by the time they wanted to donate to us. An old uh, drone that was used for testing avionics and stuff. There's actually, two of them. There's two of these things. It's, a, it's what we would now call a fixed wing, delta wing aircraft. It's got a propel, propeller in the back and it's got some avionics and this and that. And these guys said, hey, we want to give this to you guys so you guys can do some work. And we said, okay, cool. So we, we kind of started to take it and the administration said, oh, whoa. like what? Drones are blowing up people and spying on people, and that's not us. So you can't have that. And so then I pushed back, and so my colleagues pushed back, and to the administration's credit, they said, okay, cool, maybe we're wrong. But we have some concerns, and the concerns aren't just ours. The concerns are of being expressed in the newspaper every day and this and that. So here's the deal. We're worried about this. So you have to make a policy that proves to me that you're going to be you know, safe and you're not going to spy on naked people at the beach and all that kind of stuff, right? So I, I know, disappointment. 
So I said, okay, cool. That took about two years. As, as you guys all know about this, when you involve the lawyers and you involve the, the different levels and everything. Long, and here I thought that we were way out in the boondocks, that we were um, so far behind that, um, that we were some little country bumpkins and, you know, we were, you know, years behind what everybody else, what the real quote unquote universities were doing, right? Long story short, we finally get this po policy approved and put forward. Now it's become the template that everybody else in our 23 campus system has to follow. So that, in one sense, that's great. On the other, I feel really bad because I hate making other people go through hoops. But essentially what we created was, if you guys know anything about human subjects work, right? So we're gonna do some psychological tests, whatever. There's a group that's set up that you run your stuff through just to make sure that you're not violent, violating somebody's rights, that you're doing it appropriately. We've set up the same thing for, they don't care about the underwater robots. They think that's, that's fine. It's aerial stuff that everybody's worried about. And so we have this, this board. And it doesn't exist to block everything. It exists to make sure stuff's being done professionally. And if there's a problem, they say, you guys didn't say you're going to have a fire extinguisher. You should have a fire extinguisher or whatever the case may be. And now other campuses are using this. So it turns out we thought we were behind everybody else. We're actually in front of just about everybody else, at least in California, with this, um, with this policy. And so that was key. And the key there was confronting it, not pretending it didn't exist or not running away and not doing what I typically do of just, you know, break the rule and then apologize later. <laughs> um, so that was the first part. The second part was we did get a little bit of money. And our first money about robotics was a NOAA grant, an educational grant. Um, and, and so uh, this is the first. So we had some of these units outside. This is called Open ROV. This is an open source platform. It costs $700. Uh, unassembled, and the, and the kids assemble it, the students assemble it, people assemble it. Uh, we tweak ours out, we add some sort of fancy bells and whistles now, so ours cost more like about 1500 bucks. But again, it's not millions and millions of dollars, right? And so this was the starter thing. So this, this, is, our, this is now our main default research model. This is what we've used to monitor the refugio oil spill. It's what we take around the world with us. It works solid, it goes down to about 100 feet, no problem. We think we can take them deeper, but, but that's, that's coming. And so the key thing, though, this is an education grant. So this is what we're doing at, at our school. This is what we're helping our partner high school uh, work on and do stuff like that. Um, and the model that evolved out of this organically was not me going in and telling this kid to do this or you sign up for this cat, the class. It was peer-to-peer -peer mentoring that grew up organically around this technology. So I, I helped a little teeny bit, but, but it was mostly the students. So what the model that we have is anybody comes into our lab, they, I mean, we do lots of stuff in my lab, but, but, but our, our pirate R part of the lab, they come in and they don't know anything, they watch some videos. They watch some YouTube videos that are free. How do you solder? What's the basic principles of this and that and a few things? And then one of the, the sort of mid-level students helps them and mentors them and shows them how to do the soldering, how do we do this safely, how do we do it responsibly, all this and that. The, the sort of mid-level students are getting mentored by the advanced students and all of those students, Gesundheit, come to different schools, uh, they, they, they go with us doing displays, so all those students are all getting practice mentoring folks. So the whole thing is mentoring and then what happens is rather than me go, hey, there's this new thing. They figure it out themselves and they organically spread it to all of them. So they learn stuff way faster than I do, right? So I'll go in the lab, I'm like, did you hear about whatever? I'm like, oh no, that's awesome. I'll go talk to them, another student. Did you hear about whatever? Oh yeah, we've been talking about it for three weeks. Like, what? <laughs> you know, so, so, so this peer-to-peer -peer mentoring um, has been uh, incredible. Not only, and sometimes the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring helps us get more sophisticated, Sometimes it helps us get more simplistic. In this case, this is a mate robot. This is what we build with our middle school students. And so initially we thought we were gonna build this big fancy thing. And then after a little bit of trial, the students like, uh-uh, that's, no, that's not happening. Let's do something different. So, and we're good with that. Again, we're, we're, we're technology agnostic. We're not wedded to any one particular thing. We use what works. And, um, and so sometimes, like I said, more sophisticated, sometimes more simple. Now we're at a place where the Ventura County Office of Ed, um, we, have a, we have an Air Academy and that's taught on campus. So, so this is one of our uh, classrooms on campus. This is now dedicated to that. And uh, this, this front part is uh, the, the teaching area. Uh, it's a year long program uh, and they do class instruction and build stuff. In the back, it's a little maker space. 
so they can they can do stuff they can drill things um, we don't do anything totally super crazy but they can you know do stuff to help them create uh, the parts that they need so we have everything right there and that resource is now not just there for the high school students my students can use it if they my, my university students uh, can access it if they need to we've been bursting at the seams this is our our old lab and we just have tons and tons of students everybody wants to be involved with this which is great and this looks like my office and I'm always chaotic um, and this is our brand new building that just opened up uh, four months ago now I know we can't all get new buildings but this new building is the, probably going to be the last, which is depressing and stuff to say, the last publicly paid for building uh, on my campus because it's very clear uh, the writing on the wall in terms of funding. So what we've done, though, is instead of making a traditional classroom or a traditional research space, we've made this a hybrid and the tables all move. So everything is portable. The fume hoods move out of the way. So it's an incredibly flexible place. So I know it's hard to get new space. I know it's hard to get new building stuff. But with this maker space idea applied to our spatial parts of our school, um, it actually builds a lot of value, right? And people can see the value in doing the investment because it's not just for a, a sit down space or it's not just for an exercise space. It's one of these hybrid, hybrid places. And so this is where we teach our classes, our students hang out, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, another uh, part of this is our printing bay. Our printing capacity is getting greater and greater all the time. So this is one of our uh, main printer right here, 3D printer. This is the largest one on campus. We do most of our printing there. We started printing and stuff started screwing up and it wasn't working right. And it turns out because the guys that designed the building put the air conditioner right above this thing. So it was blowing cold air and this stuff basically melts little plastic and then it, so it was like, that sucks. So then we um, spent a whole about $4 at Home Depot and built this insulated box and it works really well and people come and go oh, that's very oh, that's very high tech and where would you do that you know and it's like my students did that uh so so again everything is adapting the printers are adapting to our spots the printer over there is a brand new one we just got from china that guy can print two things at a time it could print a conductor and an insulator we can print our own circuits um really cool uh that thing uh we're printing and it started messing up a lot so our students put a webcam and i don't know if you can tell this there's a webcam right on the top and then stream the video. So now, because sometimes when you print these things, it might take an hour or the bigger pieces or so. You don't want to just sit in there. Now they can be in class somewhere or anywhere else and then turn on or off the computer if it causes a problem. So, so even the, the traditional technology is evolving in the hands of the students. They, they just look at it as a thing to mess with, which is awesome. Uh, the, the, the third one we're getting, which is going to come from Italy in a couple of months, and the third one in this particular part of the lab, um, it'll grow plastic out of a pool of liquid. Crazy science stuff, right? And, and then on the right side over here to the right, when we talk about standards and how we can, it, it, literally we're limited by whatever you guys can think of. So on the right, we have a new part that's coming in a month or two. That's gonna take plastic water bottles. You throw the plastic water bottles in, it's gonna grind them up, melt it, and make our own filament. So you can talk about sustainability, you can talk about all that, and, and, and this stuff I'm saying, I didn't invent this. This is like $700 on a Kickstarter campaign and stuff. This is not bazillion millions of dollars that you have to have some giant, if you have giant funding, that's awesome, but you don't, don't feel like you need a 200K grant to get going in this, uh, in this arena. Um, and then just another quick example. So we're also all about interdisciplinary, I'll show you a little example in a second. But um, one example we're doing right now is we're collaborating with the art department on a performing, performing art piece. The, the art students are crafting the dance and the choreography. My students are creating fairies for them that'll float over them and, and move with the choreographer. So we're using the 3D printer to figure out how we can have LEDs that are inside our uh, drone that kind of shine out in different funky ways. So you know, we're using it for the art department, this uh, 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 technology. This is another thing, we're uh, separate from robots and stuff, but we do all kinds of conservation research in my lab. Uh, we're working on restoring an endangered plant in the Santa Monica Mountains, and we're having a hard time. It grows with a lichen. The lichen all burned up in the 2013 Springs Fire. So it's, and we transfer, anyway, long story short, I need more lichen, and lichen grow slower than I progress. So it's long time. And so one of our current ideas, this is a model of a coral. We're printing a coral, and we're going to cover this in, in natural latex and foam and see if this can't act like a mimic of a lichen. So this 3D printer is helping conservation. We can talk about sustainability. You can go in many different directions. It need not necessarily be robotics. 
Uh, and then we started doing training because we realized because of things with the FAA and this and that, my students need to be trained. So now we have a, a evolving curriculum where students from across campus can take this stuff to learn how to safely and professionally use these tools. So they don't crash on the 101. They don't do silly things about looking at Brad Pitt's butt in Malibu and stuff like that, right? <laughs> they're, they're responsible. So this, is, this was our first class, our first basically introduction to drone class called something different, but that's sort of what it is, um, at uh, uh, last spring. At, at Channel Islands. Uh, as I said, we, we do a lot of outreach, stuff like this, but, but also um, we get invited increasingly to other places, not because we're crazy smart, but because many people aren't interested in the, in the end use of this technology. The people are really interested in building and flying this. They're not so much interested in how you get data and how you do stuff like that. So one quick example, we're probably getting on here, but one quick example of our interdisciplinarity is the fact that we are really curious about this technology, not just as the science crowd, but also, how does the rest of the community feel about this? Are people freaked out about this? So um, we do public opinion polling around this. And so, for example, this is the result from last year. This is about 1,300 in-person in -person surveys that we did with, um, that we do every fall. We just launched one. If you guys are interested, I'd love you guys to take our drone poll. But, um, but, but this is from a, a separate poll about uh, life in the coastal zone that we've been doing for about a decade. And basically what we ask these folks is, hey, what do you think about small unmanned robots, you know, personal robots flying around? Do you think that's good, bad, or whatever? And what you see is almost exactly what you see with all this, um, with all this technology that we have. We see this with, with all kinds of stuff. And this really comes into play, I think, when you guys are talking about how you're going to educate your students about this. So the first thing is negative, if we add up the, the views people think it's negative and the views people think it's positive, what you get is you get about negative views, 29%, about twice as much as the positive views. And so you think, oh, people hate this. It's really negative and no, 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 right? It's just like the political debate. All the extremes in the debate are what get printed, right? Or what get talked about. But I think the key part is not the positive and negative. If we add both those up, that's but a fraction, right? If we look at neutral, and unsure, that's 50, 60% of the people haven't made up their mind about this technology. And we see this over and over again. So what that means is, over the next couple of years, maybe everybody will go really negative and think this is a bad idea. Maybe it is a bad idea. Maybe they'll think it's a positive idea, right? So the point is, despite what people might have you think, what the FAA or others might have you think, this is, this is totally not contained yet. This is an evolving thing. People aren't sure. And so one of the reasons we do so much work on training and safety is because we want to make sure our students are operating responsibly. And when they go out in the big bad world, they are a voice of reason and honesty about this technology. When stuff is bad, they say it's bad. And when it's, they hear something that's not right, they, they, they call people on that and say, well, that's not exactly the way it works. So interdisciplinary in all you know, policy, all kinds of senses. Okay, so now I'm probably almost out of time. You guys probably got to get your, your, your thing. But I have a couple examples to, to tell you guys about some of the ways this technology is being used uh, in, and how we're using it in and around the coastal zone. So the other, first thing to say, though, before I talk about that is even when we do research, it's education. So as we're doing research, the students are constantly evaluating stuff. Does this platform work? How does it fly in this, in this area? So we're constantly learning. So um, that's, that's, my student, that's one of my students on the left that was just... Uh, he used to run my lab, now he just got hired a couple weeks ago to go work for a big bad Silicon Valley company, so we do a good job training these guys, but I, I train them so well they leave, which sucks, you know, so uh, anyway, but we don't have any money, so we did have a welder's helmet, so he built a virtual reality helmet out of a welding helmet, so, so that's what that is over there. Um, we get, the thing on the left is an infrared sensor, so we're testing out all different kinds of sensors um, that, that we use to, to survey mammals, but you could easily do physics and heat, heat description and stuff with that stuff. Um, again, a lot of high school stuff. And then this, this in the backdrop is our first pass at mapping a South Pacific island with some of this tech. So when we go to places like uh, the Cook Islands and the Aitutaki, um, it, it's everybody's learning, not just in the actual how to fly stuff, stuff breaks, right? TSA hates electronics. So anytime we go somewhere, there's something broken, some wires, so they have to be able to adapt on the fly. Another great skill they have to learn. Um, and, and then we have a whole series of examples I can tell you about. So this one you might have heard about. Have you guys heard about this? The Phones and Drones, the Nature Conservancy. So this is a project that just started to look at the, um, that we're contributing to, that, to look at um, uh, the effect of climate change. Why? 
Right now, our sea level is about one foot higher than it quote unquote should be, thanks to the El Nino and El Nino goings on, right? And so as we have these big king tides and other things, it's pushing the water up even higher. So we have all these uh, uh, colleagues and I work on models of climate change and sea level rise. And so this is a perfect test, but it's really expensive to go up and monitor the coast. Instead, you can use a citizen science approach. You guys can do this. Your students can do this. You can, if you don't have a drone, you can use a phone. And so at these high tide things, you take a picture of your feet, you take a picture of where you are and where the water is. And at the end of this season, the Nature Conservancy is going to pull all these things together up and down the coast and see how well our models match. This is, a, this is sort of like looking 15 years into the future. So we can do that kind of stuff, right, that anybody can see the value in. So this is from a, I probably have to restart now. This is from a 15 minute flight of one of our drones several hundred feet over, uh, away from this cliff. So this is a coastal cliff and we've flown it with one of our robots and then we've used one of these pieces of software that we use that we got so good at they hired my guy away <laughs> to go work for them. Um, and so this is what you can do. Again, I can't emphasize, this is a 50, it took a little more than 50 minutes to process the data, but this is one flight, you know, woof. And so this is what you can do with this, right? So you can come on in, we can zoom on in. I don't, the screen, it's much clearer, the screen is not the most clear thing, right? So we can twist it around, we have a 3D model, right? So think about that. You have an endangered bird, you don't want to go hang out by it because the bird's going to freak out or whatever. We might have a, 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 you know, a burn or something like that. You can do this and we can go back and do the surveys after the fact. So what this is doing is taking all these photographs, creating a, a, stitching them together just based on what they look like. There's no geos, if you have geospatial data, it does even better. But just what I can do right now, I can take a picture of you guys right here in this crowd and we can make a 3D map of you knowing nothing about the GPS signal or anything. Then it creates a point cloud, a three-dimensional model, and then it restretches the, the photos over that. Awesome. Super awesome, right? Um, and so the program, by the way, you can download for free. It, it, the full version costs money. There are, there are free and open source versions of this also. So this one we think is a little better, which is why we use this one. But, but you can download this for a 14-day free trial and just do it in class and then delete it, right? So, <laughs> so, so... So this kind of stuff is incredibly powerful, right? We can talk about topology, we can talk about mathematical stuff, and most importantly, we can do a huge amount of conservation work that either was very expensive before this or was doing things we just simply couldn't do before this. Then my students use this stuff. This is my students doing research, mind you. This is not me telling them what to do. This, we have a year-long uh, research requirement and before my students can graduate. So these are my students taking <clears throat> our ROV out and they were looking at the effect of a marine protected area, a park out on, uh, near our research station on Santa Rosa Island. So they went out and they drove this submarine and they counted the fish very accurately with laser beams that measured how big the fish was and everything. Sounds very high tech. It's, uh, the cost is a less than $2,000, right? Um, and so, except for all the burritos and things they have to eat to keep them, keep them going. But the idea is, you can ask these questions. Does it, does it matter? Does being inside the protected area matter or not? Um, turns out in this case, it didn't. Then we can use this technology to do things like, like respond to real crises. And this has been one of my biggest, um, I don't want to get angry, but, but one of my biggest frustrations with the FAA that they've restricted stuff so strongly, we could have absolutely helped with the refugio oil spill more than we already did. And that requires beer and a lot more time for me to explain why. But the, the, the short answer is, I think it's being irresponsible to not use this technology as we could. In this case, we packed up some of our guys, went off on a boat and went and looked subsurfacely to see if we could see any deposited oil. And I have videos and stuff I can link and share with you guys, but we're probably getting tight on time. But, but basically we drive these things underwater and see what's going on. Then we can talk about, right, even, even basic stuff that um, this is this past January in uh, Maui, one of my colleagues, we took uh, a, a waterproof version of one of our uh, quadcopters and she does behavioral work on humpback whales. So we're the first ones to get a permit to do this kind of research. And all this is is a camera, <laughs> nothing fancy, no fancy whatever. And they do behavioral work so they need to watch these critters. And they normally up until now have had to follow them with a boat. Right? And so you can imagine, like, you know, get the hell out of here, right? <laughs> so now you can be much farther away and have this device, you know, the whales don't seem to care. They think it's a seagull, right? They're, they're not freaking out. They're behaving normally. So even that stuff uh, is, is, uh, is doable uh, with this technology. 
Um, and then we have uh, we've done a lot of stuff in in uh, places like the Cook Islands. And so uh, I'll, I'll do this maybe last video, and then uh, you guys probably get to, got to get to your raffle. But so this is a class. This is a class I took to the Cook Islands this summer. Uh, my colleagues and I have been going for a couple years, but this is the first time we took a class. Um, I should also say that this class is supported by my university, so my students only pay one third the cost. Campus pays two thirds the cost, which is huge. Most of my students could not afford to do this kind of experience if it wasn't for that support. Um, and so, I'll tell you, this it'll start playing in a second. So this is us, as well as a university in the UK that a research university that started pairing with us because we know about robots and they don't. They kind of flooded their robots. They're awesome guys, but we have much more practical experience. So they sent one of their grad students. Yeah, these, are, these are my students getting ready to get in the boat. And so this is a grad student from the UK, a master's student. And he's trying to look hard. He's trying to look like he's a macho dude. Um, so this is uh, over Aitutaki Lagoon. This is, a, this is a sand island that just formed, or just, well, formed the last 10 years. So we're spinning around here, looking at this place. And so we're, we use our robots to measure the reefs, to fly over the island and map the, the land. This is an area that has a lot of challenges with sea level rise and a bunch of stuff, and they need help. So here we're throwing the, one of the robots in the coral reef, and he's going to go count fish. Um, so I'll just let this go while I talk. Um, one of the neatest things, uh, this is flying in, one of the neatest things is we met this guy, Guy Trimby. So what they use is they use light to measure things. And uh, long story short, we helped them build their robot, and they use a special kind of light. Special kind of, yeah. The other thing is everybody loves this technology. You talk about engaging with people. If you're doing it safely, everywhere we go, the kids come up. The old people are like, what is that? The kids are like, what is that? Right? Um, and these guys are being silly and being young college people and driving bikes around and stuff. So um, these are my students' videos, I should say. I did not make this video. Um, uh, this is, this is uh, we're using the, our fixed wing to fly around. And he's kind of trying to come in for a landing. And he's going to screw up. And he's supposed to land on the soccer field. And it got super windy. So because we train him so well, this guy's supposed to catch it. And he's like, well, no, no, go make a goal. So he goes and makes a goal right here. And then he spins around and comes back and lands. So he was very proud that he made a goal. And I was like, why didn't it land? But um, uh, this is, this is uh, looking, uh, mapping a, a little part of this island. Um, we're teaching the local high school how to do our research techniques. So this local high school is engaged with, you know, so it's, it's bringing technology to folks that maybe don't have a lot of technology, leaving stuff with them, training them to monitor and all that kind of good stuff. So this is one of our robots under run. Okay, this is what I want to talk about. So this guy in the UK, never met him, talking on, so my students are helping them through Skype fix their research tools, right, in the UK. Uh, now he has a special light, this light that makes coral glow. The coral has these proteins he's looking for that he wants to use in medical imaging and all this and that. So right now we've turned the light on and we've put a filter on. So this is now night. And when you see like that thing, that thing, that, that's tape, ignore that, it's tape. Yeah, the, but, but those things that are glowing, uh, and this is ra range and fine. So those things showed us that, and so there's coral everywhere. Not every coral fluoresce, certain species did. From this one little educational class, we're getting peer-reviewed scientific papers coming out of this. This is where we stayed. Um, but uh, uh, we're finding that we, can we think we can detect disease in coral, that if you look at the coral, you can't see, but with a special light. That thing that we made, that thing that we made, we made it because we have a 3D printer. So he had a design in the UK. He printed part of it. We made the rest of it. And we showed up in the South Pacific and like, oh my god, I hope it makes. And it all fit together. And it worked really well. <laughs> So, so, and I know that sounds like you're not gonna work with people in the UK, but you can collaborate with folks on other campuses, right? That have these ideas for parts, and with this technology, you can merge those together, and they actually work together. It's not the olden days where you had to come and measure yourself everything, and cut it, and redo, do, do, do. And it's, it's really a truly game-changing uh, technology, this stuff. Um, and then we're, we're actually forming a consortium to work with uh, you guys and other people, and we're out of time to talk about that. But, but long story short, what I said before, Understand the context when you're talking to your administrators and whoever that this is really different. This is not another thing we're talking about. This is we're talking about pushing our school into a new place, a new level. Uh, next is as much as you can steal from our idea, which is this notion of get a little bit of equipment, create some policies, stuff that plays back and forth. We were just given $10,000 worth of stuff last week by a drone company. 
it was they were crashed parts. There was things that were broken, or people said those things. <laughs> so we had to sign a legal thing, so everyone's trying to fly it, right, and all that kind of jazz. But most most schools, most engineering schools, like I don't want that, right? We're like totally because my students can rip it all apart, and even though the whole thing might be broken. There's going to be parts that are salvageable, right? The structure might be fine. The, the propeller might be fine. So my students are so stoked for spring break, the ones that aren't going with me to Louisiana, because they're going to spend spring break pulling apart all this cool stuff. The advanced students and the totally novice guys that don't know anything about what a wire does, they're like, this will be fun, right? So they're getting to pull this apart. And then when we're done, we're going to have an incredible array of, of parts to help us, right? So it's, we, I mean, I'd love for somebody to give us expensive stuff. So if you guys are expensive, we'll take it. But, but, um, but we, but we do fine with the junk stuff, right? So we consider ourselves really, um, really a scrappy is a word people use, right? And, and sometimes we think that is a bad thing. For these guys learning, that's, I think, actually more important. And if we had every single thing we could buy off the shelf and this and that, they would be flying the off the shelf. They wouldn't be learning how to fix this stuff. They wouldn't be learning how to repair it. And when our students get employed, that's what the employers say they like. They like this creative thinking. They like this ability to go outside the box and to be comfortable when stuff fails and not cry and go off and be depressed, but look at, let's, let's take a look. Maybe sometimes we cry, I cry. And then, but then let's go back and let's, you know, do it up and let, let, let's, let's keep going. And that, this technology is really, um, even though I do all kinds of research with owls and dead things and whatever, uh, this technology has really spurred that notion of trial and error and experimentation, unlike uh, just about anything else that I've tried. So with that, uh, this is my contact info. Um, uh, if you guys are curious, you can check out our research blog. It's, it's our, it's, and so my website is piratelab.org. So if you go aarr.piratelab.org, you'll, you'll find stuff about us. We just released, just this morning, this year's annual poll. It'll be open for a couple months. So, um, so if you guys are interested in taking the online poll, there's a link to it in one of the most recent blog updates. If you guys want to get in touch with me, please do, by all means, send me an email. Um, but my only, my only request is I get about 400, 500 emails a day, and it's almost impossible for me to keep up with email. So send me an email. I will try to get to it. But if it's important and I'm not responding after a while, send another one. If I don't respond, please uh, send me a text on my cell phone and say, hey, dude check your email on Tuesday because I, I, I'm honestly not trying to be rude. I just, I just, I can't keep up with uh, too much stuff. So uh, thanks for listening. And, uh, and there's all kinds of other things I can point you to, but that website is a great place to start. And thanks for, I appreciate so much what you guys do. Keep talking to the students, keep inventing. And I look forward to see what you guys do next year.